It's not going to get clicks if you say, studies suggest that sunscreen may be slightly more harmful than we thought. What is going to get clicks <laughs> is your sunscreen is killing you and your children and your skin is all going to fall off. Hey, it's Kelly. Welcome back to my channel where we talk all about gentle skincare and sometimes self-care and sometimes we talk about both at the same time. Today, I'm bringing you a conversation from my podcast, The Journey, a self-care podcast that I had a couple of months ago with Michelle Wong. Michelle is a chemistry PhD. She is a science communicator and she's a content creator better known to you as Lab Muffin Beauty Science. So Michelle is myth busting her butt off in this conversation. We talk all about sunscreen marketing claims about benzene. We talk about reef safe sunscreens. We just talk about why we are so susceptible to misinformation in this field. And I am so grateful for the work that Michelle does in this community, sharing her knowledge and making us smarter consumers in the long run. I am so excited to bring you this conversation. This is just a shortened version um, where you get to see us talking. It's a really cool video conversation, but if you want to hear the full conversation, head over to my podcast, The Journey, a self-care podcast, where you can hear the whole episode. It's available wherever you get your podcast. You've been in this space now as a science communicator, especially around beauty products, I think almost 10 years now. Am I am I right on that? Yeah, a bit over 10 years now. I think, yeah, we're coming to 11 years, which oh is goodness. quite a long time. I feel like a dinosaur in the <laughs> social media landscape. I right. <laughs> I know we talked about this um, when I had you on um, in the first season about your journey from blogging to YouTube. And now, of course, like, you know, Instagram and TikTok are, are dominating right now and you're you're on it all. Um, but in your time in this space, you've probably seen the rise of misinformation um, around beauty products. I think this is a pretty obvious question, but like you've seen this, like it's exploding um, with a lot of misinformation or just plain wrong things um, going on in a lot of fear mongering and uh, marketing tactics around uh, not such good information. So can you tell me a little bit about that? And what do you think like, where do you think these myths are coming from? And I, I think especially around sunscreen is probably the one that we see the most. I think um, misinformation's always been around, as I'm sure everyone knows. Like, back in the 90s, it was those emails that people forwarded. My mom forwarded a whole bunch of these to me. And that's one of the reasons I actually started my blog, because mm. I was like, I need to look deeper into this because people like my mom are getting sucked into all these things about how um, back then it was mostly like shampoo, so shampoo contains SLS, which is used to wash the garage floor, and therefore you shouldn't use it on your hair because it will cause cancer. It was like one of those early myths. And I mean, we see versions of this now. And I think, yeah, this sort of fear-based myth mm. is super, super popular. And yeah, it's been around forever. It's just mutated a few times. And now with things like Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, um, it's just been super boosted. And I think one of the reasons this sort of thing is so effective is because um, as humans, I like to think everyone is good deep down. Um, and I think that's why we share these things. Like we'll see a warning about how shampoo might be causing cancer. And then we mm -hmm. think, oh, no, um, I need to share this with my friends because I don't want my friends to get cancer because I care about them. I, I want to protect my family members. And I think fear-based stuff really taps into that. Um, and that's why fear-based misinformation gets such a massive boost on social media. Um, it is essentially a sharing platform where you want, where people um, get incentive to share things that are entertaining or are interesting or helpful. And yeah, unfortunately, misinformation a lot of the time is a lot clearer um, than the truth, which is usually a bit more messy and complicated. And mm. so misinformation just gets shared a lot more widely. Um, also, there's lots of things in the algorithm which kind of make sense, but also superpower misinformation. Um, things like percentage watch time and completion time um, is one thing that TikTok tends to boost. So the more people watch through your whole video, um, the more it gets boosted in the algorithm. And again, misinformation is just usually a lot simpler um, and a lot more catchy because you can do whatever you like with the misinformation. You, you, you're kind of, if you're trying to tell the truth, there's only like 
um, a much more limited number of ways you can tell it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's just a lot easier for misinformation to spread. And I think the biggest one that I see, and I feel like I'm like, why is sunscreen under fire? (laughs) Because sunscreen is... As a beauty influencer, for me, of course, it's like it's it's a tool for my skin to protect my skin. It's definitely part of my skincare routine, but it is a health, you know, uh, protective accessory, if you will, too. Um, do you have any like insights as to why sunscreen in particular is something that people really like to talk about right now? I think part of it is because sunscreen is actually regulated as a drug in the US. And so it's one of the, I guess, more common drugs that people interact with because, I mean, everyone is recommended sunscreen. Um, And I think it's also because sunscreen inherently has like scarier names than other ingredients in our products. Mm. So, um, and they're all like kind of isolated in a little box at the top of the label. So you look at the sunscreen and the first thing you see is all these long, complicated names with lots of like Zs in them. And I feel like that (laughs) is sort of like a um, stranger danger signal almost. Mm. Like you see avobenzone and you're immediately like a little suspicious. Um, And this is just one of those um, cognitive biases that we have as humans. Back when we were all um, living on the prairie or savannah or whatever it is, um, and we were just trying to survive, um, we developed all of these instincts that helped us survive. Trying to get to the truth of something, trying to understand the science is a really long process. Like I've been looking at the science behind beauty products for 11 years with a PhD, and I still have to look into it really deeply. Like Mm -hmm. to make a video, it takes me about, if it's a complicated science video, it's like 40 hours. Um, And most of that is just in-depth research. And so, yeah, trying to get to the truth is a long process. And back when we were um, still hunter-gatherers, we didn't have that long before, you know, a bear would come out and kill us or something, and then we couldn't pass on our genes. And so in terms of evolution, um, what was selected for was being able to make good gut decisions um, that Mm -hmm. saved us. And so a lot of these things like fear, were really baked into us. Like it would be okay if you were more scared of things than you should be because you ended up surviving. Mm -hmm. If you were maybe a bit more reasonable and you didn't, you weren't as scared of things, then you'd probably die and your genes would die out with you. And so, yeah, over time, evolution has sort of selected for these very quick, um, instinctual, Mm -hmm. fear-based reactions. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to evolve out of that since. And unfortunately, um, one of the reasons that we have evolved so far as humans is, well, firstly, the fear. Um, But also these days we have better tools like Mm -hmm. science. But we still have this much longer standing instinct to be scared of things, to succumb to these cognitive biases like you know, we should be scared of things that are unfamiliar. It's one of those things that we really have to kind of evoke our rational brain to override. Mm. And that's always a longer process than just succumbing to the fear of a long, scary name. So I think that's one of the reasons why sunscreen is um, such a big topic. The other big thing is there is actually a lot more research on sunscreen now, especially in the U.S., and also in Europe as well, actually. Um, And part of this is because science is evolving and everything is being researched more, but because sunscreen is a drug and because it's a special category um, of cosmetics in the the EU, I guess not a special category, but its ingredients are in a special category. They get scrutinized a lot more than any other ingredient that we have in our products, except for maybe preservatives, which is also its own special category. Mm. There is new research coming out and there is also clickbait. Um, So one of the big problems with um, social media being such a big thing is that traditional media is um, kind of losing a lot of its financial backing. And so a lot of websites are now dependent on advertising and also affiliate links, which is also how we survive too (laughs) as um, people who are making content. Um, But one of the things that helps with ad revenue is eyeballs 
having just more people click through and see the ads is going to increase profits. And so there's this sort of overall drive towards more clickbait headlines. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the time with science, science, again, it's complex. It's not going to get clicks if you say, studies suggest that sunscreen may be slightly more harmful than we thought. What is going to get (laughs) clicks is your sunscreen is killing you and your children and your skin is all going to fall off. Mm -hmm. It's giving you more skin cancer. Um, than it prevents. So a lot of these studies have turned into these clickbait headlines where it's just the more spectacular the claim, the more likely it is to get widely shared. Mm -hmm. And yeah, basically algorithms are ruining our lives. (laughs) I'm still seeing these headlines about the benzene in sunscreen. And we talked about that just before we started um, recording because I was like, is this still like, is this still going on? Is this still a thing? Is this even a thing? Because it does make really good headlines, even when I read it and I'm like, I don't think that this is something I need to be really too concerned about. And yet here's another headline telling me I need to be concerned about this and I'm feeling that fear creep up, even though my mind is like, it's fine. Um, And I'll probably end up reading it anyways. So that's actually something that I wanted to talk about because I do, I get asked about the benzene scandal. There's another extreme word, right? Um, About the benzene, especially, I think it's been found um, quite often spray sunscreens. And um, I wanted to get your take on if that's something we should be concerned about. So where the story came from was, um, So benzene is a solvent that's used in, or it used to be used in a lot of things and now it's used in a lot less because we have discovered that it is linked to some forms of cancer. And it's mostly linked to leukemia in people who work with industrial amounts of it. So benzene um, as a solvent usually um, in industry, it's used in really, really large quantities. We're talking like thousands of litres worth. It is also an additive in petrol um, or gasoline um, at about 1%, I think it used to be. I'm not sure what it is now, but it's been lowered over the years because it has been found to be somewhat harmful um, and there's better alternatives. So um, benzene is not allowed in products, I think, anywhere. Um, In the US, I believe it's limited to, there's a few different limits for different types of products, but for drugs, I believe it's limited to less than two parts per million or something like that. Um, There was a slightly different limit that was introduced for hand sanitizers because of the whole Mm. pandemic rush. Um, And in Europe, it's also limited to, I can't remember what the amount is, but basically, yeah, there is a limit to it because it has been found to be harmful. Um, So a lab went off and tested a bunch of different products, including hand sanitizers and sunscreens, and they found that there were higher amounts than were permitted. Um, I believe the highest was about six parts per million that they found. Um, So there was this whole thing where the lab published a report. They got a um, a dermatologist who wasn't a toxicologist to comment on um, what benzene did. Um, He commented incorrectly, Mm. but he was the guy they hired. So um, all his comments were in the report and the press release, and that got distributed to the media. Um, And they didn't actually consult anyone who understood benzene toxicology to comment on it until later on journalists asked benzene experts. Um, And so, yeah, this was a massive scare story because it was found in sunscreen. In particular, it was um, mostly spray sunscreens, but Mm -hmm. also some other sunscreens too. I think there were some tube sunscreens and also some um, aloe vera after sun care products as well. Um, And the sunscreens were chemical and mineral sunscreens. So, I mean, it was found in the aftercare aloe vera gel, so it obviously wasn't linked to actual sunscreens. So, yeah, this was a massive fear thing because um, benzene is classed by the World Health Organization as a class one carcinogen which means, um, yeah, it causes cancer. And there's a lot of stuff talking about how there's no safe level of benzene. Um, And I think a lot of where the fear came from was just um, the fact that scientists use language in a different way to everyday people So, um, Mm -hmm. or everyday usage. So, for example, if I say there's no safe level of um, benzene for cancer, In everyday life, we would think, wow, that means if I get any amount of benzene, I have massively heightened my risk for cancer. I mean, yeah, we think of it basically like we're swimming in a nuclear power plant. (laughs) We are going to die in the next 11 days type of fear. For scientists, what no safe level means is that any amount will increase your risk. 
but the amount of risk that it increases by could be really tiny. It could be increased by like one one tenth of a percent per year. So that means over your whole life, you might not even get an increase of like 5% of cancer. Um, and yeah, because I mean, we're not going to live past 100 probably. So yeah, um, how scientists use language is very different from how everyday people use language. And one of the issues with this report was that they got someone who doesn't understand toxicology. And so he just went on about no safe level and how bad that was. Um, and all the press seized on that. But in reality, six parts per million is actually really, really tiny. Mm -hmm. um, really what this whole thing shows is that our standards for drugs in the US and in the EU and everywhere else that has this very low limit for benzene. These are really, really stringent regulations. And so um, the expert on benzene who did end up talking about it, um, he mentioned something like um, the amount of benzene in a sunscreen is equivalent to just breathing in city air for half a day. Oh, wow. Um, because benzene isn't petrol. In terms of how scared you should be, the answer is like not very. Yeah. And the fact that it's like all these brands are doing this recall, even though it's not actually that dangerous, is a really good sign that the recall process is working and mm -hmm. things are being caught well before um, any sort of real danger is happening. And if you are concerned about benzene, the best thing you can do is if you live in a house where your garage is attached to your house, um, don't park your car in the garage because the benzene coming emitting from the from your car, assuming you have a car that runs on petrol. So um, if you have an electric car, this is irrelevant. Um, yeah, that amount of benzene is enough, is going to be way more than the amount you're getting from a sunscreen. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly the perspective. Cause it's like, it sounds really scary. No amount is safe. And then you're like, Hey, I parked my car in my garage. <laughs> that's attached <laughs> to my house and I'm fine. So that is actually reassuring. So chemical and physical sunscreens. Um, so most of the time when we say physical sunscreens, we mean mineral and there are two minerals that exist um, for sunscreen, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Um, for chemical sunscreens, there are, I believe about seven commonly used chemical sunscreens in the US. Mm -hmm. In the EU, there are about 20. And that includes the seven used in the US. Um, and yeah, so chemical sunscreens, um, organic sunscreens, carbon-based sunscreens, these ones are the ones that have a lot more flexibility. Um, there were two, possibly three, that have just been approved in the EU over the last two or three years. Um, I think one, actually, I think one of them hasn't been approved. It's kind of like in that um, in that gray zone where it's about to get approved, mm. but you can sort of see um, there is a lot more innovation possible in the organic slash chemical space than there is in the physical space. Physical sunscreens are basically just ground up rock, um, very pure ground up rock, but still ground up rock. There's only so much you can do with ground up rock. Mm. Um, and as a lot of us know, um, with zinc sunscreens, you need usually like 10 to 20 percent zinc to get a decent SPF. And yeah. so that means one tenth to one fifth of your tube of sunscreen is ground up rock. Um, that's as nicely as I can put it. Um, there's only so much a chemist can do to make ground up rock feel nice. Yeah. It is always at the end of the day going to be ground up rock. On the other hand, with organic sunscreens, there are so many possibilities with what chemists can do with that. Um, you can make them like some sunscreen ingredients are liquids. Some of them dissolve. Some of them can also be particles, not quite ground up rock, but still more particulate. So they can act like um, particles. And yeah, so there's just so much more flexibility possible. I just don't think there is any way that in the future we will move more towards inorganic sunscreens, hmm. except for the fact that the U.S. is extremely slow with their sunscreen regulation. Mm -hmm. um, so the U.S. passed a sunscreen monograph in 1978. Since 1978, I believe there have only been three new sunscreen filters approved. Um, in 2019 and 2020, there were two studies done by the FDA where they applied sunscreen to volunteers and it absorbed into their bodies and they tested their blood. And they found the sunscreens in the blood. Mm -hmm. And part of this is simply because we are really good at detecting things now. We can detect really, really small amounts. So the amounts they were detecting was on the scale of nanograms per mil. 
um, which is really, really tiny. Mm. And, um, yeah, the FDA basically just never really looked at this before. Um, they just always assumed that there was less than 0.5 nanograms per mil. Um, and it turns out there were higher amounts. And so um, these were published and the FDA said, well, now we're going to look more into sunscreens. Um, now we're going to say chemical sunscreens are not generally recognized as safe and, and effective until we get more data hmm. on the effects and what the relevance of these absorbed amounts are. And the sunscreen scientists were like, well, finally, um, but also um, <laughs> in the EU, absorption has been recognized for a long time. Um, there's been studies from the 90s where amounts were um, detected in urine, which means that um, so urine is um basically produce from blood, like your kidneys filter mm. the blood and turn it into pee. Um, and, yeah, all the waste products get put into the pee. So if there's sunscreens in your pee, it must have absorbed into your blood at some point. Um, so this wasn't really a surprise. Um, it's just that the FDA has very um, specific guidelines for the data they want. The EU does as well, but the process is, I believe, a fair bit more flexible. Um, so, yeah, scientists can use um, discretion to interpret studies, whereas for the FDA, because sunscreen is a drug, there are more stringent requirements. Basically, in the US, um, at the moment, the only filters recognised as safe and effective are zinc oxide and titanium dioxide because they don't absorb. Yeah. Um, there are chemical filters that are newer that also don't absorb, but they haven't been approved in the US. Right. Um, the US has seven filters, like I said, like six of them were approved in 1978. Um, and one of them, I believe avobenzone was approved in like nine, in the early 90s. Mm. So in terms of the technology, it has progressed a lot since then. There are much safer chemical sunscreens in the EU than in the US. And the US ones aren't actually that unsafe. But I mean, yeah, in terms of relative, mm. like speaking relatively, the EU ones are much better. I guess there's like kind of two paths for the US to take. Either everyone has to use zinc oxide and titanium dioxide or they approve the new filters, which are safer. Yeah. Um, and they could approve the old ones as well. Interestingly, um, in the EU, there's actually been questions about titanium dioxide recently, um, oh, wow. which has also sparked a whole bunch of misinformation online. Mm. Um, basically, the Food Safety Authority has said that titanium dioxide is carcinogenic. Um, the EU has very strict rules about things that are potentially carcinogenic. They regulate them in a different way, which is a bit controversial with toxicologists. Um, but yeah, titanium dioxide has been banned in food. And so now the cosmetics, um, in cosmetics, it's also getting reassessed. Mm. And so it's possible that due to that, then the only so-called safe filter might actually be zinc oxide. And then on top of that, I'm sorry, this is turning into like me just <laughs> like having a therapy session I love without it. sunscreen. <laughs> oh. no, I, okay, this is my last bit, I swear. Yes. So very interestingly, um, recently I started looking at zinc oxide sunscreens. I hate zinc oxide. Mm -hmm. um, I think I make no secret of this. Um, zinc oxide sunscreens always look white on me. Mm -hmm. They always make my skin dry out and go patchy and it's just terrible. And it's because it is a quarter ground up rock. Um, but I started looking into zinc oxide sunscreens, which I didn't before. And I've discovered that a whole bunch of clean, so-called clean 100% 100 mineral free sunscreens actually contain an ingredient called butyl octosalicylate, which mm -hmm. is basically octosalate, but with a few extra carbon atoms. Um, so functionally and safety-wise, it is probably the same or extremely similar to octosalate, which is a chemical sunscreen ingredient. Um, and a lot of these mineral sunscreen companies have been just bashing chemical sunscreens the whole time yeah. while using an ingredient that is basically a less tested, less regulated, and by all sort of objective measures, less safe mm -hmm. version of a chemical sunscreen. And I think this sort of thing is probably just if the if the FDA decides to go, um, decides to take their sweet time on approve like recertifying or like the safety of chemical sunscreens this sort of thing is just going to happen more mm -hmm. and this is like a thing that happens a lot in clean beauty called regrettable substitution which is where you get scared about an ingredient um and then because people are scared people use less of them like parabens is the 
um, prime example. Um, but it's a necessary ingredient, and so they end up just putting in less safe, less tested. I guess not necessarily less safe, but less tested versions, mm -hmm. which could well be less safe yeah. in their products. And so overall, we actually end up with less safe products because people were scared about something um, where the fear was just stoked so much um, out of proportion. Yeah, we saw this in K-Beauty. This was a while ago. Like, you got to be OG K-Beauty fan to know about this one. But back in, like, 2012, maybe, uh, Benton um, is a brand that is very much, like, natural, nature-based kind of marketing. And they, um, they didn't want to use, like, preservatives <laughs> in their products. And so they used, you know, the natural the little extracts or whatever and a lot of their products actually ended up getting moldy and they had to do a recall and there was like a big it was a big thing about their products going moldy not being super shelf stable and that's a very regrettable you know substitution we saw that too with um fragrance being substituted with essential oils which caused a lot of it, it burned my skin. <laughs> it caused a lot of um, skin sensitivity, thinking that you're doing maybe possibly thinking you're doing something better uh, for yourself, but actually ending up getting burned literally in the end. So yeah, I remember the Benton. I had a bottle. Yeah. <laughs> the, I think it was the snail bee mm -hmm. um, essence. Yep. Yeah. And there were like little fuzzy bits in it. Mm -hmm. It was such a big scandal back then. I guess like if it happened now, Maybe it would have actually been better for um, for me. <laughs> um, maybe it would have been like a much bigger story now that we have all it of these social been. media channels. Because mm -hmm. 2012, it was really just Reddit, right? Like yeah. I remember people posting photos on Reddit and everyone mm -hmm. was freaking out. And it was, I mean, that was even like back then there was barely anyone on YouTube even. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that would be such a big scandal and it would have been good propaganda for against clean beauty I think mm -hmm. um maybe it's time to revive that and turn that into a fear story <laughs> another one I want to hear you vent about which is the whole <laughs> reef safe I'd love to hear your take on why maybe we shouldn't take that so seriously when we're looking for sunscreen products um you are right in that I have a lot of feelings about this <laughs> <laughs> um, so be careful what you wish for Kelly okay. <laughs> um you can tell I'm like straightening in my chair, yeah, stretching in preparation for this. Um, all right, so story time. Um, there may be a lot of inaccuracies here because I am just pretty much telling it as a story. So <laughs> forgive me for this. But um, so in 2016, a study came out, which was um, by a scientist called Craig Downs um, and his group. And it, they basically um, chucked a bunch of coral into concentrated solutions of sunscreen and they saw that they bleached, um, which is not that surprising because, I mean, yeah, you're just dumping chemicals on, like concentrated chemicals onto mm -hmm. coral. Um, yeah. So they also went out into the environment and they um, sampled water from around beaches and they found that some of the beaches had concentrations of these sunscreens that were um, above what was needed to bleach the coral. Specifically, um, there was, um, I believe it was oxybenzone. Yes, it was oxybenzone where they found um, the highest concentrations. And then this study got pushed to the media. And later on, I discovered that um, Craig Downs had actually gone to a bunch of um, clubs. And there's actually a video recording of him doing a speech where he said, um, in his professional opinion, um, coral reefs have died off more because of your bathroom than because of climate change or pollution or what have you. That is almost an exact quote, <laughs> um, which is, I think, quite clearly not what um, the scientific consensus says. Um, pretty much every coral scientist, and I believe Craig Downs actually said this later on as well, has said that climate change is a much, much bigger contributor than everything else. It drowns everything else. There right. is no point going on about sunscreen when climate change is happening. Um, so, yeah. Um, so there were early signs that there were some um, non-scientific consensus stuff going on. Wait, did um, you just say so Craig on, Downs has also, he's disavowed his study? <laughs> um, he hasn't disavowed his study. He's disavowed his previous 
thing about how like how terrible okay. bathroom chemicals are. Okay, that is a warning. <clears throat> However, <sign, though. laughs> it is a warning sign. Yes, more warning signs. Since then, he has published a bunch of studies that are not on coral, um, and like I think he's he's published one that was on like oxybenzone causes like pregnant women to like causes Hirschsprung's disease in um, in babies. Um, like if you're a scientist, you know that people who study coral generally like will never publish another study on babies. Mm. Like they are just very, very different species, very, very different. Like you would not research them in the same building right. um, sort of things. Um, so yeah, more red flags, um, more red flags. His closest collaborator is someone called Joe Donato, whose email address used to be, um, chemicals are toxic at gmail.com. Um, oh, it would have been worse if like, you said at hotmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, that's a good point because he is a um, retired toxicologist. That was his title for a long time until um, I believe Craig Downs hired him into his lab. So now he has like a more academic looking email. Okay. But chemicalsaretoxic at gmail.com <laughs> is the email on a few of his papers and also his submissions to the FDA. So Joe Donato has a few submissions to the FDA where he says um, dermatologists are all paid off by sunscreen brands um, and the reason melanoma rates are rising is because people are using more sunscreen. So, um, yeah, I'm. this is just to give some context to um, to the, what sorts of collaborators this guy has. Mm -hmm. um, He's actually commented on my blog a few times with the chemicals oh are toxic at gmail.com email. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, Red flag. At one point, they also published an article where they called me and dermatologists a propaganda source. Oh, that's right. Um, which is now very proudly on my um, on my resume. Yes. But yeah. So, um, so more specifically on the coral reef thing. Um, so since his study, um, other scientists have looked at his study and um, they've seen a few issues with it. Um, so one of the issues is that the concentrated the concentration of sunscreen he measured is actually above, I believe, the um, the organic level there, which means that it's just either um, it's it's an outlier, like it's a massive outlier. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly unlikely that that concentration, that high concentration, that bleaching that bleach causing concentration is widespread it could be that he just happened to sample right next to where someone with oxybenzone sunscreen was swimming right it could be that he um it was actually a contaminated sample there are some questions about the methods he used for the measurement as well mm -hmm. and so right. yeah um basically there's just no way that that is a a common finding um, even near reefs where people are swimming. The National Academy of Sciences actually recently, I think a couple of weeks ago, released a report on the impact of sunscreen. All the, Basically, it's like a 400-page report. Um, I've only read like maybe 100 pages so far. <laughs> it's very dense. It's very detailed. It is very good. Um, the only... My main complaint about it, though, is that the conclusions um, are quite vague compared to what's actually in the report. So sure. you kind of have to read the 400 pages to get the full story. Um, but yeah, it looks at all the different impacts of sunscreen and what we know about it. Um, as you would expect, the data is incomplete and we need more studies to see all the effects. But coral reefs is actually one of the more, um, more the areas where there's a bit more info and it's a bit more settled. And it is pretty clear um, that sunscreens have minimal impact on coral reef, if any. And the places where there would be measurable impacts are pretty much only specific reefs, which are very, very close to people who are swimming. Um, and that would be because of things like um, the water currents are moving in such a way that it just happens to concentrate the sunscreen near the reef. Yeah. Um, and even then, that level of um, whether or not that has any impact is still a big question mark because wow. um, it is mostly just outlier measurements and that haven't been repeated. Um, and yeah, if something hasn't been repeated, it could well be a fluke. So yeah, I guess like the moral of the story is um, sunscreen is incredibly unlikely to have any impact on coral reefs. 
um, and you don't have to worry unless you are swimming right next to coral wearing sunscreen. And even then, um, on top of that, the marketing of yeah. coral reefs safe sunscreen. So most of the time, what they what people mean, what brands mean when they say reef friendly, mm -hmm. is simply because the sunscreen doesn't include oxybenzone and octanoxate, which were the two ingredients that Craig Downs um, saw bigger effects with coral on in his study. Um, now, he didn't test every sunscreen filter and he also didn't test on different species of coral um, or coral in different stages of development. Um, other, other studies have tested other sunscreen filters and um, interestingly, zinc oxide is actually one of the more toxic mm -hmm. sunscreen ingredients for coral. Um, and this includes non-nano zinc oxide as well. So what's happening is zinc itself um, dissolves and that acts as a toxin for corals because, I mean, um, it is technically a heavy metal. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, if you, look at, um, if you look at the environmental regulations in the EU, um, if you look up zinc oxide, there is literally a symbol which is the aquatic toxin symbol and it's like a symbol that has a dead fish in it um, on the zinc oxide <laughs> listing. So, yeah, zinc is not really as benign as um, a lot of people think in yeah. terms of environmental impact. Environmental impact is important, um, but the emphasis has been on entirely the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. um, coral reefs are not a huge issue in terms of environmental impact. Um, there are lots of other aquatic species that are much more affected. And then on top of that, the sunscreen filters that people have been focusing on, oxybenzone and octanoxate, are not the ones that are most concerning. Um, I believe the most concerning ones, which the EU is acting on, are actually octocrylene and zinc oxide. Oh. Um, those seem to have the most general aquatic mm -hmm. toxicity. And zinc oxide is um, apparently a bit more of a worry because you have to use so much in a product. Um, octocrylene is um, actually, yeah, I don't know about which one's worse or anything. Um, it really depends on what species and stuff, but those are the two filters that the EU has really been focusing on. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, expect to see those um, being more public in the future. Yeah, sunscreen is really not that big an issue compared to other things like climate change. So it's worth thinking um, whether if you throw out a sunscreen, um, whether the carbon impact of wasting that sunscreen is worse than using the sunscreen and just finishing up and then buying a bottle that is perhaps a bit more environmentally friendly later. When you are thinking about whether or not a sunscreen is reef safe, you are probably going on a holiday. Um, you are probably flying very far from where you are. So maybe that is a better point of focus than like what your sunscreen is doing. And I think we do tend to focus on things that we can change like that um, and not focus on things that we want. Like not going on holidays is a lot less negotiable than whether or not you're picking a better sunscreen. Right. And so I think um, sometimes, I mean, I do as well, we might hyper-focus on the sunscreen choice mm -hmm. rather than, and we might think that that absolves us from, like our other contributions. Yeah. And I think, yeah, that's probably a moment for self-awareness. Um, I don't think not going on holidays is really a necessary part of dealing with things like climate change. I think um, it is much more about collective government actions yes. than it is about individual actions. And we shouldn't guilt trip people for going on a holiday or for, um, for having children or that sort of thing. Um, I think it is very much like we live in a society, we have to survive under capitalism, et cetera. But I do think um, it's good to think about whether this is really a smokescreen for our own inaction. There's a lot more to the environment than reefs, and yeah. reefs are actually one of the lesser um, impacted species when it comes to sunscreen. Thank you so much. Like, this was amazing. This was um, so much information, a lot to think about. But ultimately, I think we're left with the positive message that, like, you know, we have all the tools that we need. So where can listeners um, connect with you more, follow you, consume your content, give us all all your socials? <laughs> um, so my blog is labmuffin.com. I'm also on 
um, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. Those are probably my main three um, as Lab Muffin Beauty Science. And yeah, um, if you have questions to ask me, probably ask me in a comment. Um, I'm really bad at reading DMs. I'm really sorry, but there are so many. Um, and yeah, if you have suggestions for videos, which um, I have a massive list of topics to deal with. Um, yeah, ask me in comments. Um, tag me in misinformation that you want me to debunk. What an amazing conversation. Thank you again to Michelle for sharing her time with us. It was such a great time. I have links to Michelle's socials in the description box because if for some reason you are not following Lab Muffin Beauty Science, get on it, especially if you enjoyed this conversation. If you want to see more from me, you watch this whole video and you haven't hit subscribe yet, please, I would be so honored if you would subscribe here to my YouTube channel, or if you want to head over to my podcast, see what that's all about. I would love it if you could follow the podcast as well. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for supporting this channel and thank you for creating this amazing community that we are building. I love you so much much and i want to let you know that you are doing an amazing job just keep going i love you i hope you are healthy happy and safe and i'll see you soon